My name is Todd Malone, and it's my pleasure to bring you the message this morning. I, um, I want to pause for a second and reflect on Sarah's prayer. What she prayed for is exactly what we want this morning. We want to encounter the Lord. Our desire is not that you would leave here with strategies for life. This is not a TED Talk. Our goal here is that you would come face to face again with this is who your God is. And because this is who your God is, this is how you live. Well, this morning we are starting a new series. I'm very excited about this. Along with the new series, we're starting the 21.5 Project, so... Kind of in line with Easter, we have a lot of new things going on right now. Uh, our series is on the first five books of the Bible, which is often called the Pentateuch. Now, the Pentateuch is very, very foundational to understanding what God is doing in the world. It goes back to the very beginning. That's actually what the word Genesis means. It goes back to the very beginning, and it starts unfolding from the very beginning what God is doing in the world. And by the way, if you want to know what is the purpose of Scripture, it's that we would know who God is. It's the same as what our sermon is. So, so many times we look at Scripture and we think it's an owner's manual for life. And we just need to find the right page to solve the right problem. And although it is incredibly helpful and practical for living life, if that's how we view it and we never understand who God is from its pages, we miss the point of the Bible. And that's what the first five books do is they begin telling us who God is. And with that, we, import, we transition to a very important question. Who here has seen Avengers Endgame? Ooh. Uh, and some more enthusiastically than others. Outstanding. I saw that in the back. Well done. Um, so uh, for those who haven't seen it, let me tell you how it ends. <laughs> Just kidding. But I will tell you this. Thor is my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> now, there is one issue that comes up a couple of times in the movie that's actually really important. And if you saw the Avengers film that led up to this one, Infinity War, you'll probably know what that is. You might remember that towards the end of that movie, there's this comment that's made that there are four, something like 14 million different possible outcomes to the future. But only one of them has the Avengers winning and saving the world. And so all through this movie, the second movie, the audience is asking itself, and in fact, the characters ask it out loud a couple of times, is this the one plan that will work? And all through, these, all through the movie, these characters are making these gut-wrenching decisions. They are taking crazy risks, and they are sometimes sacrificing things that they love dearly. And all the time there's this tension that hovers over the movie. Is this the plan? Is this the plan that will work? And then you hit these moments in this movie, like when Captain America fights Captain America. Seen it? That makes sense, but it does make sense. And you're wondering, is the, is the plan falling apart? Is everything coming unglued? And it leaves you wondering, even, even if there's a plan at all, let alone if this is the plan that's going to work. A week ago today, terrorists in Sri Lanka decided that Easter Sunday was the right day to blow up three churches. Yesterday, a gunman picked the last day of Passover to open fire on a synagogue in northern San Diego. And there's this tension that starts to rise inside of us. Is this the plan that's going to work? What is God's plan 
in a world that is twisted and broken and upside down where it seems like even the best efforts of really good people come to nothing. And that is exactly the tension that we encounter in the book of Genesis. And today's passage gives us one of the earliest glimpses of what God's plan is. And it's a plan that is still in motion today. Now, chapter 12 represents a major turning point, a major shift in the book of Genesis. In the first 11 chapters, Genesis talks about four key events that affected all of humanity. There's creation, there's the fall, there's the flood, and then there's the Tower of Babel. And both the flood and the Tower of Babel are about God judging rebellious mankind. And the Tower of Babel, that story actually occurs in chapter 11, right before where we pick up. And we see in chapter 11 that God scatters the people into nations and it creates a deep divide between those people. The story of chapter 12 actually starts at the very end of chapter 11 because it suddenly focuses down on one man and one family. It introduces us to a man named Terah, which I thought was a girl's name. Turns out it's a guy's name. And Terah moves his family 600 miles from Ur to Haran. He settles there and then he dies. And Terah is important because he is the father of Abram. And Abram is the father of the Jewish people. And starting in chapter 12, and really through the next 13 or so chapters, Abram becomes the focus of the book of Genesis. Now, when Terah moved his family to Haran, they actually were on their way somewhere else, but they decided they were going to stay in Haran. And as they stay in Haran, we find that they prosper. The family does well. But there is still one thing that Abram and his wife, Sarah, lack. It tells us right at the end of chapter 11 that the one thing they didn't have was a child. The story of chapter 12 really picks up right at that moment. Because it is at this point that God begins to unveil his building plan. He unveils it in a covenant to Abram. And then Abram responds with a commitment to God. And God's covenant is revealed in the first three verses, verses one through three. Now the covenant actually starts with the command. God tells Abram to leave everything that he has known and that is familiar. And the way God gives the plan highlights that there is incredible personal cost to Abram. Do you notice what he does? God tells Abram, first you have to leave your country. And then he starts to narrow it. It's not just your country. You have to leave your extended family. And then he narrows it more. It's not just the extended family. You need to leave even the immediate family. See, the point is that God's plan is going to cost Abram. Abram will need to let go of the land, the people, many of the loved ones who are closest to him. For Abram, the covenant that is in front of him means leaving what is comfortable for what is uncertain. Then the covenant unfolds in a series of promises. The first promise in the covenant is about a place. God is going to take Abram to a very specific place. But God doesn't tell Abram where it is. God doesn't even tell Abram anything about what the land is going to be like. The only thing that Abram knows is that God is going to take him there. Have you ever noticed how often God does this in our lives? Have you ever noticed how often God calls us to release the past so he can move us to the future? God doesn't always tell us where he is taking us. Maybe sometimes that's a physical move, but not always. I, I know several people in this church right now who God has taken them out of one ministry, but they don't know where their next focus is going to be. And God is telling them, wait. He puts us in positions where we must let go of one thing before we can grab the next because it forces us to trust him. It also keeps the thing that we would want to hang on to from becoming more important than what, what, what God wants to do next. See, and this is what Abram did. That's what God did with Abram. 
Abram had to trust God and move before God gave the details. The next promise is that God promises to turn Abram into a great nation. Now think about this in context. Abram already had land. He already was rich. But there was one thing that he did not have. He did not have a child. And so God is offering Abram the one thing that he lacked. But go back even further in the context to earlier in chapter 11. The world has rebelled against God, and God responds in judgment by scattering them into deeply divided nations. Now what is God doing? He is forming his own nation. It's almost as if God raises his plan of salvation out of the dust of judgment. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes even as Christians, we think that God's judgment is the last word over our lives. But the answer to that is always no. If you're in a relationship with Jesus, salvation is always the last word. Then God makes another promise. He's not just going to raise up this people and abandon them. God promises to protect Abram. And he promises to protect his people. And I think there are two ways that are alluded to in this passage. First, he's going to provide for Abram. That's what's behind the idea of God blessing him. God is going to provide all the resources that Abram needs to accomplish the assignment God has for him. Second, there's a statement that God will bless those who bless Abram and curse those who dishonor him. That is actually a great translation of verse 3. Because the idea is that God is going to deal very harshly with anyone who even just disrespects Abram. Anyone here ever seen one of those collars that are designed to train a dog not to bark? So, um, I've never worn one. But uh, here's how I understand they work. You put the collar on. And every time the dog barks, the collar does something to the dog that makes the dog feel very uncomfortable. And over time, the dog becomes more uncomfortable with the collar than whatever it is that they were barking at. And so the dog learns not to bark. Or actually, as a vet friend of mine pointed out, the dog learns not to bark until you take off the collar. This is the idea of what God is doing here. God is going to train the people around Abram. They're going to figure out quickly that if you are good to Abram, good things happen to you. But if you're bad to Abram in any way, extremely bad things are going to happen to you. The final part of the promise of God's covenant to Abram is that God is going to do something through Abram. God is going to bless others. And this actually shows up in two different places in two different ways. In verse 2, there's the promise that Abram will be a direct blessing to others. God is going to work through Abram to bless the people who are right around him, who are in contact with him. But then verse 3 extends the blessing. It goes from beyond the people who are right around him to the entire world. Abram and his people will be a channel of God's blessing right where he is, but ultimately to places that Abram will never go. How is verse 3 fulfilled? It's happened. It happened when a baby was born to a virgin whose name was Jesus, but who was called God with us. And then ultimately what we just celebrated was the culmination. God with us lived a perfect life and went to the cross and was raised again three days later. And in that, the great exchange took place. Every sin that we have ever or will ever commit was credited to him. And his perfect righteousness was credited to us if we are his follower. And it doesn't matter race, gender, 
It doesn't matter socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter political affiliation. It doesn't matter where you were born or when you were born. The entire world can be blessed through God with us. Let's get a reality check here. I want you to picture that your son or your daughter or your closest friend comes up to you and says to you, hey, we're moving. And you ask, where? And they say, I don't know. Are you moving to Kilgore or are you like moving to another country like Oklahoma? Um, I don't know. Is this going to be like an hour drive from here, or is it going to require flying over an ocean? I don't know. Are you moving north, south, east, west? I don't know. They can't tell you anything. Now, let's pretend that you remain calm, and you ask a logical follow-up question. Why are you moving? So I can have everything that I have right here. Except for one thing, a child, that's important. If your friend or your child says that to you, are you really going to say, hey, great plan, I'll help you pack. But isn't that essentially Abram's situation? The only reason, the only reason that Abram has to go is because God told him to go, and Abram trusted God. And that's what Abram does. He trusts God. He obeys. He commits to the covenant and to the Lord. Now, the next paragraph shows us how Abram obeyed. He traveled 400 miles from Haran into Canaan. He stops at a place called Shechem, and then he travels to Bethel and to the Negev, and that would take him all the way to the southern region of Canaan. So, in other words, what you see Abram doing in this passage is coming into the land from the north and then traveling all the way through it from top to bottom. The emphasis in these verses is that Abram trusted God and obeyed. It starts with the word so to emphasize that there's cause and effect. God issues a command. He makes a covenant. And as a result, effect, Abram obeys. He obeys exactly the way that the Lord told him to. And for the reason that he trusted what God was going to do. Now think for a second about what this trust involved. Abram is 75 years old. Think about that. How much of a hassle is it to move your family across town when you're a young family? Abram is 75 years old, and he's moving his family, his possession, and all his employees 400 miles, no moving vans. How long do you think it'll be until the first nephew or niece or child of one of the employees pulls on Abram's robe and says, "Um, are we there yet? I'm bored. And he's got to deal with that as a 75-year-old. In addition, verse 6 makes this little side comment. There were Canaanites in the land. It's easy to miss that, but that's important to remember. There are already people living where God is going to take him. And these people are not going to welcome Abram. The Canaanites are not excited about God's plan, and they're going to resist it. You see, Abram's obedience is going to take him right into conflict. It's easy to focus on the blessings that God promises Abram and miss what Abram's obedience required. We saw in verse 1 that he had to leave home. And here we see that leaving home meant incredible hard work. It was time-consuming. It was sacrificial. And the payoff was not going to be a friction-free life. The payoff was going to be conflict. It makes me pause and wonder a little if Abram thought it was worth it. God called him out of a comfortable place. He called him into sacrifice, hard work, and conflict. And upon entering this place, there is resistance. 
And I think it would be natural for Abram, for you, for me, to wonder if this was really the right plan and if this plan was worth it. But you know what? The text answers that question for us. We know that Abram thought it was worth it because of how he responded when he got there. Abram worshipped God. Did you catch that verse 7 is the first time in this whole story that Abram actually knows that this is the land that God has for him? The vague promise of a land that Abram is going to see in verse 1 becomes a very tangible promise that this is the land that Abram will possess. The land far from home and filled with Canaanites is the land that God has for him. And Abram responds in worship. And then he continues to move through the land. And as he continues to move through the land, he continues to worship. And sometimes that's not easy. We see where God is taking us and discover that it's full of Canaanites. God moves us into a new ministry, and we find that it is more challenging than we ever thought. It's like we are far from home, and it is full of Canaanites. And the question is, can we worship? We finally, finally see the new job or community or relationship that God has for us and discover that it's more challenging than we ever imagined. And it feels like we are far from home, and it's an assignment that is full of Canaanites. Do we long for the place and for the people of our past? Or can we declare with Abram, God is good? Despite the cost, Abram commits to God's covenant. It's a covenant to build God's people in a particular place with provision and protection to carry out their purpose of being a, a channel of God's blessing. What does Genesis 12 have to do with us? What does God's building plan look like today? Well, I would argue that it's remarkably similar. Abram was asked to leave the comfortable and familiar. He was flourishing in Haran, but that is not where God wanted him. God's plan to build his people will always call us to leave the comfortable. That is because he calls us to grow together even when relationships are hard. So when we enter a hard conversation, instead of letting bitterness or anger fester, when we share resources that we would rather protect, we are paying the cost of God building a people. We are entering the land where Canaanites live. A friend of mine just yesterday shared some thoughts with me that probably were not easy for him to share. He gave me some feedback, and it was feedback I needed to hear. It was excellent, excellent insight that I will value from. But this would never have happened if he was not willing to enter a hard conversation and risk rejection. See, that is leaving comfort and journeying into where Canaanites live. God gave Abram, gave Abram a place, a place for his people to grow and from which they would impact the world. And isn't it interesting, that is exactly the plan that you see even in Acts 1-8 as the early church is built. It's what you see Paul doing all through Acts, establishing Local communities of believers who from that base of operation impact their own towns and then reach the broader region and ultimately the world. But they start right where they are. We have a family in this church who just recently invested very heavily in a local person who is in tremendous crisis. They spent tremendous amount of time and money to minister to this person, to find a place for this person to live. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't just about giving money. The person also became a regular part of this family's home. The family didn't just give stuff and keep them more at arm's distance. They gave themselves to build a long-term relationship. Here's what's really fascinating to me. This family 
is a family that spent years on the missions field. They understand God's desire to bless the entire world with Jesus. But this is a family that also gets that God has placed them in Longview today. And they are to be a channel of God's blessing starting right here. God's plan always involves using his people to bless right where he has placed them. God's plan also involves a people. God did not promise just to make Abram a great man, although he does promise that. God promises went way beyond that. God promised to make Abram into a great people. God's plan always involves making a people. One of the greatest lies that Satan has fed Christians is that their relationship with God can really come down to being just about them and Jesus. And that is a lie that breaks God's heart. It has always, always been God's plan and will be God's plan to build a community. How would it change your approach to relationships if you made unity with one another your driving passion? What if when someone disagrees with you about politics or school choice or vaccinations or your favorite Avenger, we didn't blow up at that person on Facebook or talk about that person to others or cut ourselves off from that person? What if our instinctive response was, I disagree with that person, but now I'm going to make the effort to grow closer to that person? Not to manipulate or convince them because you recognize that this is a place that is vulnerable to Satan's attack. Satan wants to drive a wedge between us. He wants to divide us. He wants to isolate us. And what we want to do, if we are focused on unity, is to be proactive about strengthening our bonds. Being a people is more important than being right about most of the things that divide us. God did not call Abram to build a great nation. God said that he was going to build a nation. We are not going to build God's church. God is going to build God's church. It is not up to our talents, our experience, our hard work to make the church thrive or to keep the church safe. We do not provide the power to accomplish God's mission. These are all accomplished and provided by the Lord. We have what we need to accomplish the task that God has given us. And it's not because we are talented or wealthy. It is not because of the size of our checkbook or the size of our congregation. It is because of the size of our God who watches over us. God has a purpose. God's plan was to bless those around Abram because of Abram. Over time, God would bless the entire world through Abram. Our call is to allow God to bless others through us. We do not control what happens after that. Long-term results are up to the Lord. And I told you about this family here at FBC who sacrificed so much to bless a person who is in crisis in our community by meeting practical needs, by welcoming into their family, by providing moral support. And this person that they helped, turns out, was not interested in a long-term relationship and turned and walked away. And now the family is reeling, trying to figure out what happened. Why wasn't there a happy ending? Did they do something wrong? And the answer is no, they didn't. They fulfilled their assignment. They allowed God to bless someone through them. We would love for the results to be different. And maybe down the road they will be. But it is not up to us. What they did, what we can do, is allow God to bless others through us. 
God calls us to be a people, a church, through whom this community and the world is blessed. And that requires opening our hearts and being vulnerable to the pain that even a family like this experienced. So what is God's building plan? Genesis 12, it was to build a people who would have a home base from which they would be God's channel of blessing to the world. And that is still his plan. God's plan has always and will always involve building a people who are strategically placed to be channels of God's blessing to the world. I think that's the point that Moses is making in this section, and I think it's the point that we need to take away. God's plan to reach the world. God plans to reach the world by building a people of blessing. You might remember, it's actually a little over a decade ago, there was a short-lived ad campaign for the U.S. Army. The slogan was Army of One. There are several reasons that that was a short-lived campaign, but one of them was because of the outcry from the veterans. See, what veterans pointed out is that military success is never about the one. It is about the team, the unit, people acting together. See, if the plan was to unleash a bunch of disconnected individuals into a battlefield, the soldiers and the plan would not have a chance. Battles and wars are won through teams and units working together, through communities. God is not unleashing lone rangers into the world. From Genesis 12 on, his plan has been to unleash communities of people. Of all the possible plans, it is the one plan that God has said, this will work. So how do we respond? I would suggest four ways. Again, we say this every Sunday, but there is a reason we include the discussion questions at the bottom. It's great for you to take the time to review those and think about those yourself. But if I don't say that the whole point of this sermon, the whole way to apply this sermon is to make sure we are building relationships together, then I have failed that, and that is a tool for you to do that. It is a tool to get you in conversation with others. Study, continue the Pentateuch reading plan. It's about five chapters a day. You get Saturday and Sunday off to get caught up. You know what? If you're behind and you just want to pick up where we pick up on Monday, go for it. The idea is to familiarize yourself at a big picture level of what is God doing in these first five books. Pray for God to build his people right here in Longview, Texas, in Fellowship Bible Church, that we would be a blessing to this community and a blessing around the world. And then last, participate in the 21.5 projects. These are meant to be a very, very tangible way for us to start blessing the community around us right now. You have a connection card at the bottom of this bulletin that you were given, and on the back of that, there are places that you can identify how do you want to respond to this message. Maybe it's one of these things here. Maybe it's something different. But I would encourage you to fill that out and to put that in one of the boxes that are in the foyer as you leave. It'll be either to the right or to the left. Because we as a staff do want to join you in prayer. This is important. God wants to build a people here. And we want to join you in prayer as we move towards that. So let us pray together. I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward. I'm going to invite you to stand as we close in prayer and just remind you why this prayer team is here. If you have anything that you want to talk about, pray about, that you're struggling with, that you want someone to stand with you and say, I will pray with you, I will support you, encourage you before the Lord together, that's why these folks are here. Come forward, let us pray for you. Let us pray with you. But boy, especially 
If you don't know the Savior that came from the line of Abram, who blesses the entire world and can change your life, allow us to introduce you to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer. Because the work of building a people, of providing and protecting and of accomplishing your purpose is your work. We seek, like Abram, to be faithful. We want to obey. We want to trust you. We want to worship you as you work. But Lord, we are totally dependent upon you every step of the way, and we acknowledge that here. Lord, the task of mending broken relationships, the task of hard conversations, the task of pursuing people who are different from us and have different tastes from us and look different from us, Lord, those are tasks that are frightening, and it seems like they are a land filled with Canaanites. And so we need your strength, we need your boldness, and we need you to go before us and prepare the way. And we ask that that would happen today and this week. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We leave you with this thought. God is building his people right here at FBC to bless this community and to bless the world. Leave here and be a channel of his blessing this week. You are dismissed.